Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from today. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us for today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is going to be focused on you, our colleagues and clients, and to help answer some questions, issues, problems that you may be having. This is going to be focused on uh, Primavera P6 User Forum. Before we get started, there's a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to take care of. First and foremost, all call-in phones are automatically muted in order for us to preserve the quality of the audio for all of our attendees as we are recording this webinar for distribution. We did ask for questions to be submitted <clears throat> prior to today so we can kind of show uh, the answers to the questions that were submitted, but if other questions do come up, please feel free to submit those in your questions box of the GoToWebinar screen. And follow-up, all, all of our registrants and attendees, a follow-up It's going to include a copy of the slide deck presentation, the recording of the webinar, and then answers to all the questions that were submitted previously and during or after the webinar. Uh, today presenting will be Brian Chris. He's our Vice President of Operations. I'm going to turn it over to Brian to get started. All right, Dan, thank you. And uh, to everyone attending, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, just a quick start with our safe harbor statement here for you to enjoy. Uh, also, we're going to be talking today a lot in uh, about Primavera P6, but just to give everybody an overview of the additional types of services that DR McNatty provides. Uh, Cloud-based uh, managed hosting service, if any of you or your organizations are considering uh, the migration to the cloud to run your project control solutions, we'd love to, the opportunity to help you with that. And then other integration, analytics, dashboards, a lot of those services, we have the capabilities in-house to provide, not to mention our abilities with supporting you for Primavera P6. But our agenda today for the webinar, as Dan mentioned, this is our third P6 user forum. And the purpose of the forum is to reach out and engage our Primavera community, and specifically P6, and solicit questions from you to answer in the hopes that we can kind of share our knowledge and that it's common that we might experience some of the same questions. And this way we can kind of share those in a form and everybody can hopefully learn from the questions that are submitted by others. So this will certainly not be the last one of these that we do. We maybe want to have a couple of them throughout the year. So as we move forward, keep an eye out for our newsletter and announcements where we uh, where we'd like to hear from you on the questions that you might have. So subsequent to this, as Dan mentioned, uh, you're welcome to submit additional questions and we will, um, we will log those questions and answer them in, a, in an Excel file and send those out. And then as always, this is, a, I, I think, a, a, a great uh, kind of break for maybe our normal webinar where we engage you, the, the, the user community, so your comments and suggestions for what we can do to improve this moving forward are certainly going to be welcome. So with that, let's get into our, uh, our first question. So our question number one reads, I have suddenly lost the ability to add predecessor to an activity by trying to use the assign button in the predecessor window and also by trying to use the predecessor icon. When I try either of these steps, nothing happens. I can only add predecessor using the link icon. This problem does not apply to adding successors. There is no issue with that. Has anyone experienced this or know how to resolve it? So what we surmise from this question, this one was a little tough to, uh, to, to really think through, but the main thing is that we can, as we understand it, is that the assign button here, when this gets clinked, selected to add a predecessor, the window like we see here on the screen does not uh, does not appear for the user. And so as far as an answer, this one was a little tough to come by, but we, I, I think we have to deduce that there is a probability that maybe the user is utilizing two monitors and the assigned predecessor window is popping up on a different monitor uh, at that time. The predecessor window uh, might be on the separate monitor, but the successor window might not have been moved over there at any given time. So to potentially resolve this, if that is in fact the case, check your display 
settings for multiple displays and uh, show the desktop on only one. And then once you've done this and made this change to the user setting for the computer, uh, restart your P6 and hopefully we should see that problem resolved. I tried to think about it in a number of different ways if there was any other type of scenario that would prevent that window from popping up. And there was really nothing in the research that would, that would indicate that that window would not be available. So the only thing we can really think of for this one would be that the user is utilizing two monitors. And so to run P6 on one monitor should resolve this particular issue. So question number two reads, I have a question, is it possible to create dashboards where data for different levels are displayed on the same level? So for example, activity level information side by side with WBS level or even project level data on the same row in the same table. In other words, multiple activity level data fields shown on the same row along with WBS and project level data fields. So this is actually a really good question and it's something that we encounter quite frequently. And for those of you who have maybe utilized reports uh, using the report wizard in P6, you likely already understand that P6 does a pretty good job in the way it is structured to segment or separate project data from WBS to activities and even resource data. P6 utilizes those or stores those in the database and keeps them fairly separate. So if you were using the report writer and the wizard, one of the first things you do is select a subject area. And when you select projects, a lot of the activity level information that would be available in the report are going away. So it would be very difficult to have a, a project level report, but include a, a, an activity value such as total flow. So I wanna talk about two possible ways that we, can, uh, that we can possibly look at this problem. Number one is to create what I'm called the, the tiled views in P6 Professional. So in P6 Professional, this is kind of a sample that I have here on screen where I have my different displays for projects, WBS, and activities, and just thinking about it with the question, and display those in kind of a tiled manner. So in this way, we can see it becomes, or it looks at least has the appearance of a dashboard, even though I'm using P6 Professional. So I'm going to go into P6 Professional. We'll jump out of the PowerPoint here for a second. And I'll go in and we'll see about how to, uh, how to set this up. So I'm going to open up just a few projects. And so as I open them up, I can see I've got my projects and activities and they appear on different tabs. I'll also add the WBS window. So now I have my, my three windows open here. I can move them around. And so I have my project, WBS, and activities. So in order to see these kind of in a tiled view, I have these icons over here that say, create a new vertical group or create a new horizontal group. So if I'm highlighted the WBS tab, I'm gonna select this option to create a new vertical group. And over here to the right, I can see, if I can grab the window, I'm gonna pull this over here. So now I see my WBS is in its own separate window. And then for my activities, maybe I wanna put those down below. So here we can see we've got our, our view now where I'm looking at in one screen, I do not have to, to scroll or click to different windows. Uh, I have my projects, my WBS, and my activities. So within these, I still have the ability, say for example, to open up maybe a different layout in P6. So if I wanted to look at, say, a layout that had some costs, I can change my layout. I can run filters here for my project. They just show those that are currently open. And then I could edit columns here in my WBS view. So even though I'm now just, I still have all three of the in information open, uh, I can now look at it in more of what would maybe be considered to look like kind of a dashboard look and feel to it. So here we can just see my WBS 
activities and projects and I can see them all in the same view. Now my navigation is not linked. So if I click on a different project here, I will not see a different uh, set of activities, if you will, automatically down here. So the views for project WBS and activities all stay, they all operate independently still. But what I can do is at least from a visibility perspective, I can see my project. So if I'm looking at items like the data date or cost, if I wanted to see percent complete information and then maybe cost variance, or if I wanted to run a filter down here, say um, to work, to look at say just maybe a milestone, I can see just the, this information. So even though it is not necessarily linked together as I navigate through, it is all in one screen and I can easily see each of the activities, WBS and projects. And then to escape or, or get out of this view, the button in the middle that says merge all back into one, and now it looks just like we would normally have when I open these up one at a time. But using the tiled views can, can allow you to not have to go back and forth if I'm looking at something at the project level and then wanted to check something in activities, I don't have to necessarily go back and forth each and every time. So that's something that can hopefully save you some time or at least be able to manage all of those different levels uh, of information in one place. So that would be our tiled views in P6 Professional. I also did take a look at the dashboard capabilities in EPPM. And what you can create in EPPM are the portfolio analysis views. However, the segmenting of data between looking at project information and activity information on one row, as the question asked, still does not necessarily provide you that type of solution. The other possible alternative that you would have to solve that problem would be to utilize a more customized business intelligence reporting solution to align the data to a user's liking. So here we're looking at um, the creation of what are ad hoc tables through our project status application. So as you can see here in this view, we have tables that we can customize. There'll be a select statement here where I can choose these different columns. But within a customized solution, I can have in one place the ability to have project data, uh, activity data, so here would be milestones, and then we have risk data down below. So if we were to look at, at this as an example, so here would be my custom table, and maybe I'm looking at more project level information here. So I've got my project name, I've got total cost, labor, project manager, and project type. These would be uh, project codes, but maybe I wanted to combine this project data with something else for maybe the planning uh, finish, or I should say maybe a look at the planning start. The pre-construction start. And now I can hit save. And now I can see more, more to the answer of her question would be, uh, here's my project. I have some high level cost information, project codes, but now I've also got detailed activity level information uh, for the planning finish, pre-construction start. And I can see those now more normalized onto a single row. So this type of solution would require that the data be extracted into a data warehouse and then a dashboard or web, preferably a web type of solution for the user interface is placed over the top of it, such as project status. And then from there, depending on what information is collected in the data warehouse, all of that data can then be made available here onto a single row. So we can create different columns and we can create different tables for the information that we would like to see uh, on a single row. But to answer that question, P6 will, inside of the application, keep our project data and our activity data very much separated. And so for reporting purposes, if we wanted to put them onto a single row, either a more customized solution like we're looking at here or using the tiled windows like we saw in P6 Professional, 
would be more of the way to go. Okay. Okay. Our next question is, question three asks, is there a way to automatically trigger one or more global changes as part of a schedule service? For example, in ePPM, the project schedule services page. So what this question is essentially wanting to know is, can I set up an automated routine inside of P6 to execute a global change on a periodic basis? So the schedule service or, or job services in P6 are really what would be the, the engine to do it? And the unfortunate answer to this question uh, is no. The running a global changer, including global change execution within the global schedule service or the job service, if we're looking at P6 Pro, are not available. So based on what I know and the research I've done in looking at this question, the only way to execute a global change is to do so manually. We don't have any automated routines for that, unfortunately. So question number four asks, when making changes to relationships or durations in P6, is it possible to see the changes reflected uh, automatically? Do I always need to hit the F9 key to see these changes? So this is, um, this is a function that uh, is available. And it, it, this question maybe came from somebody, I think users who are migrating to P6 from a Microsoft project uh, platform are interested in this type of feature where the changes can happen automatically. The scheduling calculation can happen automatically. So here we see the schedule window. And then typically when we are working in a schedule, when we make our changes, uh, we hit the F9 key automatically. Uh oh, my screen went dark. I don't know if everybody can see that. Okay. Um, so back to, to question number four about automatically scheduling. There is a display, uh, an option in the scheduling section. So if we look at our schedule options in the schedule window, there is a checkbox that says schedule automatically when a change affects dates. So let's just maybe take a look at this in, in P6. I'm going to come in here and choose to say all, close my projects. And now I'm going to go down here to the bottom. And I think we've got a little project down here that I can use as a sample. So I'm going to open up a, a layout that I have for just my standard layout. And here are the activities. So what would be typical is when I'm adding my activities and I'm wanting to add some logical relationships, I can come and I can click and drag to draw my relationships. So I can see that the relationship is being drawn. And then in order to see what the new dates are, I'm going to hit F9 and enter in my schedule. will recalculate to show the changes. So the schedule options here, when I hit F9 and I open up the schedule window, I want to select the options. And now I'm going to check this box that says schedule automatically when change affects dates. So I'll close this. And now when I follow that same type of routine with every keystroke, I'm not having to go back and hit F9 and enter. So there is the possibility to go through and add logic ties and say link activities. Now I can move through here. And as I add new logic or I change, say, durations, my schedule will move automatically. And I do not have to, with, to see the effect of every change, either through logic or durations. It's not necessary that I go in and hit the F9 and, and recalculate the schedule. So this is a setting that's in those in the preference in the schedule options that you can choose to leave turned on or turn those off to your liking. So that is the the option here under our in the schedule window choose options and then you can select to toggle this on and off this button here that says schedule automatically when change affects dates. You can choose to 
have that on or off. Now, while we're in the screen, there's another, um, this didn't come up as a question, but it was something I learned kind of recently. And it was in a, uh, it was related to, I've added all this logic, but now how do I, how do I get rid of it? So one way is to, you know, I can come in here and kind of delete these, you know, one at a time um, and manually go through. But there is another option in here where if I go into my activity network and I see now all of these relationships. But what I can do is highlight the one bar here and you can see now it's changed in the blue. And if I hold down my control key, I can now highlight everything. And now I can see all of the relationship lines are highlighted in blue. And I can say delete and it's gonna ask, am I sure I want to, am I sure if I want to remove the activity relationships? And I say yes. And I can see now that all of those relationships have been removed. It looks like I missed one here at the end, but that has now kind of taken all of the logic out. So this could be a possible helpful um, way to, if you are maybe wanting to reconstitute an existing schedule or a, a template or an existing schedule that you maybe want to use as a template, but the logic maybe can be variable. This can be a good way to perhaps remove a lot of logic ties in one fail swoop, and then you can go back to perhaps rebuilding that schedule for, uh, for another purpose. But rather than always having to go through and individually click on these and say, yes, delete these relationships one at a time, and again, I'm now having to hit F9 to, uh, to see the changes, using this, our activity network view will allow me to do essentially the same thing and do it much more quickly. So that was something I just learned recently and while we were on this topic, I thought I would go ahead and, uh, and share that with the group. So hopefully that is something that can, uh, that can help you as well. Okay, our next question is question number five asks, I run P6 on my standalone PC. When using layouts which compare the current task status to a baseline, typically last month's update set of the project baseline, Dates for the in-process activities, I assume that means in-progress activities, do not come through correctly. Past and future activities are okay, but not ongoing activities. This situation has survived a number of P6 updates and several different computer installations. Thoughts, solutions. So this, this came in, this is a question that came in kind of later yesterday. Um, so I didn't have time to necessarily mock this up. Uh, very effectively, but this is something that we have seen before. And so the thing to know is that the baseline, the primary baseline uh, by default will use the plan dates for display. So there's a couple of things to be aware of. And on the screen here, you can see a screenshot of the admin preferences. And in within the admin preferences on the earn value tab, below, down on the bottom, there is a pull down menu that asks, how do we want to deal with uh, calculations when we are comparing to a baseline? So the default value is the, uh, I believe it's budgeted values with the planned date. But one possible option here is to make sure that you look at those settings. Now this is an application setting, so this will affect every single project that we are utilizing. But look at those admin preferences and the earn value tab and determine what is the setting. Is it set to look at the variance or comparison based on the current dates or the planned dates? And then secondly, in conjunction, and this is kind of an either or, you could choose one of these, either of these two options uh, as a way to, uh, as, as a way to solve this problem. But check for the planned start and finish dates of, of the activities in the current schedule. Now, for those of you who have not discovered the planned start and planned finish, these are columns, as you can see here, that you can add to your layout in P6 Pro. And in addition, these fields can be updated manually. So for the plan dates, when an activity has not started, the plan dates will always be equal to the early, uh, early dates, and the early start and early finish. So our plan dates 
for activities that have not yet started will always be equal to our current start and finish dates, assuming we're looking at the early start and finish dates. So this is kind of helps explain, hey, for, for this question, the activities that are all in the future, you know, the baselines are, are right where, where they would need to be uh, or where they would be expected to be. But our planned dates um, can be different for activities that are in progress. And typically where this can be a factor is during my update, maybe I put an activity as started or finished and then uh, maybe recalculated, but then realized either through, uh, through a kind of uh, a mistake during the, day, during the update process or new information comes in, I unstatus an activity and say, oh, it actually has not finished or we did not start that. The planned dates uh, that were originally kind of frozen when I established the actual start and actual finish uh, become stored here. So the best way to really look at this is to make sure you understand that you can add these columns uh, to my layout and I want to check and make sure that they are aligned properly with the current schedule. Now some folks will uh, execute a global change to do this where they say, the plan date is equal to the start and finish dates. And this, walk, and this way, if I do that and then establish it as a baseline, I can make sure that if I'm using plan dates for the comparison, then that will be, um, that'll be reflect, reflected appropriately. So it would make sense that in a given period when I take a snapshot of the baseline uh, before a monthly update, my actual stuff will stay and look proper. My future stuff will look proper. But what is going on within the um, uh, within the in progress activities? That is where the plan start and finish dates can be different. So for in progress activities, align the plan starts with the current dates, and that should hopefully alleviate that problem. But that's a that's a pretty common one. And uh, look at these options for the admin preferences and the plan dates. Okay. So we did have another um, another question that came in related to team member and Bill Ocharczyk on our team is our resident team member expert. So I solicited his input for this particular question. But the question reads, can a user in EPPM that has only view, uh, view only rights in the web update tasks and team member? And the answer is uh, yes, they can. When a team member is assigned to be the activity owner, they will then have the ability to update that task um, in, within team members. So as an example here, we have a user who has only view only rights. We can see for the global permissions and for the project access, they have access to projects, but for read only purposes. So that is their user setup and their user security for access. For the activities then, when you open up your uh, projects, what you would need to do is uh, add the column for activity owner. And then when you click in the cell here, when you click in this cell, you will be, a, a window will open up and it will display all of the users in the, uh, all your user dictionary. And from there, select which user should be the activity owner. So you can see here, our activity owner is assigned to job closeout, punch list, and cleaning and testing. Once those are assigned, then the users, when they log in uh, to their team member, whether they're using the mobile or they're going to use uh, the version available uh, through the web, the desktop, they can then have the ability to see those activities, provide the update information, as far as started and finished remaining duration, even though the user profile account is set to those projects as view only for them. Okay, so we didn't uh, we didn't have a overload of questions uh, that came in for our for our forum this month, but with that in mind, I wanted to go through. And uh, this will be our bonus play. But these are maybe a few items that uh, have recently come up with other users that I've spoken with. And I wanted to maybe bring them up to the group. 
Uh, and then when we're finished here, maybe, uh, Dan, if there's any questions that have come in um, that we can maybe address, we can spend a few moments after, uh, after the presentation and see if there's any questions from users on the line. But our, uh, for our bonus information, I want to talk a little bit about uh, XML file import, uh, display multiple projects by activity and name. This is going to be a little tip. And then nested filters. So one of the things I've been talking to a lot of folks recently is to ask them if they have not already begun using or experimenting with the XML versions for file imports, I highly encourage you uh, to do so. As, as somebody who has seen a lot of installations, there are always seems to be a need. The one concern with importing data is always what is it going to do to my global data and things like calendars and codes always seem to be of a concern, as would be resources. But what the XML provides far more options for looking at the data that we have received prior to ever importing it into a production environment. So as we see here on the screen, this is an example of what we see when we are going through the process of importing an XML file. When we get to the import options, we can go to the advanced tab. And here we see a calendar. And this is the calendar section will show me for the file that I'm importing, here are all of the calendars that it contains in the file, as well as whether this is a global or resource, and I can choose an action to move it to a project or do not import. We can also see here there's a little details button, and when I click this button, I'll see another window that pops up that will tell me what are the time periods for my, uh, for my calendar. So one of the more important things with importing, in my opinion, is the calendars. And not to mention, not only to prevent kind of pollution throughout the global uh, dictionary, if you will, but also I think if any of you have done analysis and looked at P6 schedules, it's highly probable at this point, if you've been doing it for any period of time, it's highly probable that you've encountered a fractional duration. And this can manifest itself in a number of different ways, such as a one-day activity that starts and finishes on a different day, um, any other several other types of ways, uh, activities that have a total float of zero, but they are not shown as critical, meaning there's a red. What that is going to indicate is there's kind of a fractional duration uh, within your activities. And the way that will happen, and we can kind of see here a calendar that we have that we have selected but we're looking at the monday goes from 9 a.m to 4 30. well there could be another activity let's say a successor activity to an activity using this calendar on this monday maybe they work from eight to five or nine to five so that activity will say well i work from 4 30 to five o'clock and so it will start prematurely not necessarily at the beginning of the next day. And when you get enough of these types of conditions, there can be this domino effect throughout the entire schedule that you have to go through and clean up. So looking at your calendars and having a standardized day, whether it's eight to four, maybe like we see here with no lunch period, or eight to five where the noon to one period is blocked out for lunch. It's important to kind of have the standards throughout all of your global calendars. And if we're importing new data in uh, for analysis, we wanna make sure that we have uh, some controls over that. And so what we see here is the XML version does provide me some visibility to this prior to ever importing it. So I can look if I see things that do not align with my specifications, perhaps I have some specifications for a contractor that they only use project specific calendars and do not use global. I can see that here, and if there's anything that deviates from our specifications, I can stop the process right here, choose not to import it, take a screenshot maybe of this, and send it to the contractor and say, hey, play, please revise that and resubmit to us before we import and move forward with the analysis. So we saw we had other tabs in there for codes and resources, but these are other areas 
in the P6 environment that we want to try to keep clean and, and preserve. And when, I, I'll never forget in the early days when people would start saying, hey, I can import uh, you know, schedules into my environment and I just collect them. And everybody thought, great, and just started importing everything they could get their hands on. Well, they would soon discover that they would have 3,000 global calendars um, and trying to clean them up can be an arduous task. But here again, we can see with the XML, I have options to say, hey, do not import, move to a project. If I'm looking at activity codes or resources, I could choose to import them under a specific area of my resource dictionary. So I have greater controls. And there's actually prod, uh, products out there on the market that, try, that address this. But if you can use XML for the import mechanism, I think you will get a lot more flexibility in how you can review the information before anything comes into the production environment and does any, I don't want to say harm, but makes any kind of pollution or, uh, or a little bit messy in the production environment. So for those of you who are administrators of your P6 environment, I highly encourage you to take a look at the, uh, the XML options for importing files. Okay, the next, the next item I want to bring up is a, I wanted to start by showing you, this is a, a global change parameter. And what this is going to do is it's going to create a user-defined field that is going to store the activity ID and name in a single user-defined field. And this is a simple one to set up where uh, I created a user-defined field called activity ID underscore UDF. And the parameter is for, so I run this for all activities where the parameter is the activity ID, the UDF equals the activity ID plus, and over to the right here, we can see I added in a little bit of just some characters to separate the name. And then the secondary function is uh, use this UDF and then add the activity name to it. And I will do this for all activities in my file. So for those of you who maybe are receiving a contractor file or you're looking at your own schedules, but every month you take a version, you call it update one, update two, update three, update four, whether you are building out your progression of updates in that manner or you are receiving them in that manner, what this global change will allow is it'll allow you to now group by the user-defined field. And when you open up several updates at one time, you can now group by this single user-defined field and start to see if there are any variances or if there's any specific activities or group of activities that you wish to target and would like to see a history of a single activity. This is one very easy way to, to do it. The alternative way, because there is no way to group really by the activity ID or name, uh, a lot of folks will open up their updates and then maybe sort by the activity ID or the activity name. But what really becomes a nice feature here is the separation in, in the grouping. So this EC1230, this is my user-defined field. And I can see here, that I can look at the whole progression of this activity from update from the baseline to update one, update two, update three, and update four. And here we can see, uh, you know, kind of the slip in the schedule, and then we have some the progress that we see throughout here. So you can augment this with all sorts of different information, such as percent complete. And we can see these over time. We can see slips with certain activities. Uh, and then from here, maybe drill down or move around to try to identify perhaps a root cause of this. But I found that this simple global change, you can copy it, uh, you know, recreate it, keep it in your dictionary, your list of uh, global changes. And then every time you get a new file from the contractor or you create a new file, uh, run this uh, global change so that it will store all this information. And you'll find some other interesting things, uh, such as one thing, it is very easy to see uh, if a description changed um, or if somebody were to change an activity uh, ID somewhere along the line here. But we can definitely very easily see 
if a name was changed or we can see durations, but it's a good quick way to open up a chunk of files from a project and then group them and see the entire history of that through there. So this will be the, uh, the global change that you can use and it's really easy to create and I'm sure this uh, presentation, this slide will be available for all of you to, to recreate it in the future. And then finally, the last thing uh, I, I wanted to maybe share and encourage all of you to maybe experiment with are the nested filters. And so this was a filter that was sent to us from one of our uh, one of our scheduling consultants that works with a client that has a lot of projects that get opened up at a single time. And so creating the filter parameters uh, to isolate certain activities, if we are opening up you know, 700, 800 to 1,000 projects and trying to distill that information down, it can be very difficult to run multiple filters and not have necessarily the toes being stepped on. But this is an example of a very complicated filter where there's maybe a user-defined field where we're saying we're looking for any that do not contain an X, and then for those, we want to see anything that has these particular activity codes or they're equal to a specific uh, ID, and they're within a particular date range that we're looking for, say, for quarter one. So as we add different parameters, our arrows over here, similar to how we structure the hierarchy of our WBS, we have our arrows here that will allow our filter to be set up in a hierarchy. And then for each line where we have this uh, collapse expand, I can choose an option to make this any or all of the following, and that would change whether this is an and statement or an or statement above it. So this is an example of a, it's a very complicated filter, but it's actually necessary to really uh, help you work with a lot of information. So if you are in an environment where you're having to try to generate views or layouts that distill down thousands of activities into some key uh, into some key components to look at for trends or metrics. Experiment, if you're having trouble creating the filters one at a time and then running them in, uh, in conjunction with one another, I would suggest that you, um, that you take a look at the nested filters and uh, experiment with those to see if you can maybe create some, some more, conquer a larger degree of difficulty, I should say, in your filter setups. So that would be our, our nested filters. And I would encourage you to, to check on those. So that is it for our, uh, our questions uh, for this month, as well as the uh, a few additional items that I, I want to bring up. Hopefully, you find some of that information uh, that you can possibly take back and use. Before, um, before we go on, I wanted to bring up to everybody some upcoming events where we would be happy to meet and greet with you in January coming up in New Orleans. We have the CPM conference and in Los Angeles, the 2018 Project Control Summit will be held. In February, early February, we have uh, the AACE's annual Western Winter Workshop will be held once again in Palm Springs. And for those of you who have never attended that, ev that event, it's an outstanding event. Um, there will be close to, there will be 40 plus uh, technical presentations along with uh, a great group of exhibitors and presenters, and it's a, it's a great venue out there in Palm Springs. So if those of you who are interested in going to that, maybe you've been in the past and have not registered yet, uh, sign up now because it's actually a month earlier than it was previously. And then finally, in, uh, in April, the next uh, collaborate event will be held in Las Vegas. And also a reminder to keep an eye out for our monthly newsletter, The Loop, uh, to stay updated on all the, uh, the latest and greatest information. And with that, I appreciate everybody's um, attendance. And Dan, I don't know if we have any questions come in. I think we've got a little bit of time if we want to look at any uh, questions that might have come in. Uh, we actually had quite a few questions, Brian. I don't think we'll be able to get to every single one of them. But uh, as stated earlier in the presentation, uh, we are going to take 
all questions submitted both prior and during and put them into a master list and uh, answer all of them for everybody as part of our follow-up. Um, one of the questions that came in was uh, on your question two when you were talking about the tile view. Uh, is this option available in version 8.3? Um, actually, I tried to log into my old 8.3, but it's, it looks like my credentials were taken away, so I can't answer that question. My 8.3 and 8.4 credentials were taken away, so. Um, but they want to know if that tile view would be available in an, the older version of 8.3. Uh, boy, I think it did become available in, uh, I believe it did become available in release 8. I, it's been around for a while. Um, you may need to check and make sure it's not hidden. You know, in the in the tile uh, in the view, uh, so you may have to look and find those um, those icons. But I do believe that these have been in since uh, since release eight. So uh, I, I I believe so, but boy, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure uh, on that. But for whoever asked that question, I assume you're running a version of release eight. I believe it is there. If you don't see it, if you have, uh, if you don't see it, look through the uh, the more buttons to adjust your icons, and perhaps it's just uh, hidden. But I believe it's in eight. I believe it is too, but I wanted to log in. I was unable to, uh, so I have to find out why my uh, rights don't work. Um, a next question that was submitted is uh, I use a layout where I manually collapse WBS groups to different levels. I cannot set the layouts to collapse automatically because the bottom levels vary. When I save the layout, all the collapsing disappears. Do you know of a solution? Oh, I don't, uh, especially when it comes to different levels. I, I think if I, you know, if I come in here and I say, um, or maybe I'm going to say, this could be an interesting if I say collapse two, and then can I now if I've got this collapsed to a level, um, and maybe I'll save this. Uh, so I'll now say save. Um, yeah, it may not be able to collapse them all. So I'm going to open a, another one. So I guess, it, yeah, it does look like maybe uh, when I save that layout, so I don't know if everyone kind of could see that. So here's just a layout that I have open, and this B test was the layout that I saved. And before I saved it, I had done a collapse to level two. And so now it does collapse. So if you have various levels, um, I guess we can try that. And I'm going to say, I'm going to collapse maybe part one and part two, but I'm going to leave part three open and let me just save this. And now we'll try again. Here's a new layout. So it does look like maybe, uh, I'm actually surprised it worked like that, but it looked like when I saved this layout and had part three open, as opposed to collapsed all to level two, uh, it did look like it, uh, it, it showed that. So um, obviously, I'm sure that the project in question is much more detailed and complex than, than this here. Um, but it looks like if you were going to collapse, you can try it. But it may just be something that you, you kind of have to uh, redo manually if it's, uh, if it's pretty elaborate, particularly if you're going to a third and fourth level. Uh, I could see where that would be problematic for the layout to save it exactly as you had it before with only specific areas expanded and collapsed. All right, uh, next question I've submitted is, in resources under the details tab, how do I decide if I should check auto compute actuals or calculate costs from units? So in our resources on the details tab, the question is how do I decide whether to use auto compute actuals or calculate costs from units? Yes. Well, I think the answer to that question really lies in the use case. So for example, um, 
some people like to use the resources for cost. And they're not necessarily tracking hours. So resources in P6 are really designed to say, uh, I want to track, you know, manpower. That's really the, if we think about where, why the resources are there, is to track labor and manpower and, and things of that nature. Um, but some people want to use it for just cost because there's a lot of things available at, with resources such as um, maybe bucket planning or there's curves. There's a lot of things we can do with resources. But I don't want them tied to any units. So I may choose to uncheck calculate costs from, from units because I want to take a, a, an activity in my schedule for, for concrete foundation and say it is going to be $60,000. And I just, I want that value on there. And I don't necessarily want that cost for that activity to be derived from a bunch of labor or other, or other items. So if that's my scenario where I'm cost loading maybe based on an estimate for a, a full task, I don't necessarily want those dollars to come from my unit. So I, separ I essentially want to, to separate those. If I have an environment where I am tracking my resources based on a unit of measure or production, or let's say I have to excavate 100 feet of, or I have to install 100 feet of pipe, and I'm going to be paid um, per unit price of $10 a foot. And so what I want to be able to do to auto compute actuals is to say, when I've completed 15 feet, I want that cost to say, here's how much uh, the actual cost should be. Here should be my actual spend, or here's what I'm actually do. So for activities that are using maybe cost loading and the, the spend on an activity, is really predicated on a progression where it's not, is it 50% complete or 80% complete? And it's really subjective. If the unit of measure is something that is a unit that is really, uh, I can quantify it, I can see you've put in 70 feet of pipe and therefore I want it to auto compute actuals based on a rate of we're paying for $150 a foot or whatever it might be. So that would be the difference. So it really depends on the use case. Do you want those to be automatically uh, updated or do you want to update the cost separately from say a percent complete or anything like that? All right, Brian. Well, uh, there's quite a few more questions that were submitted, but there was a follow on uh, to the person that asked about the tile view in version 8.3. Uh, they are available as you had suggested, uh, just had to find uh, the add icon box. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad to know that. But uh, the rest of the questions, because we're coming up uh, to the top of the hour, uh, we will put those into our uh, Excel log and answer those, because uh, we do have quite a few more that we would not be able to get to. All right. Sounds good. Well, uh, thanks, Dan, for uh, moderating. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Uh, look, keep an eye out for our future webinars, and uh, hopefully, we'll see all of you at the uh, at our events uh, coming up in the, uh, in the in the next year. So, thanks again for joining. Happy holidays.